Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Jonathan Bennett joins me. We're going to be talking about Jenkins, the number one continuous integration server out there. Well, you're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 443, recorded July 26, 2017. Jenkins. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by the Amazon Kinesis from AWS, a powerful new way to easily collect, process, and analyze streaming data so you can get timely insights and react quickly to new information. Learn more at kinesis.aws. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, or .com, that might work too, <laughs> bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you might want to download and play with right after this show. If you're not already using today's project, you probably will want to be doing that to play with. Uh, joining me once again is Jonathan Bennett. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall, it's good to be here. I don't, can't believe I flubbed .com. <laughs> How many times have I said that? But apparently they let anybody do this show. So where are we speaking to you? Where, no, where are you speaking to us from? I am speaking from the, the corporate headquarters, the home office here in Lawton, Oklahoma. Very cool. And I am speaking again, as people recognize the background here, although it's slightly brighter this time because I'm using a new cam. Uh, well, I was sort of thinking, I was thinking about the webcam. I'm using a brand new webcam, the C922, and it looks actually like it's a, it's a little better shot of my uh, normally very darkly lit uh, bedroom here in uh, Beaverton, Oregon. So I'm home this week, uh, back on the road next week, uh, back at ZipRecruiter again to uh, be able to use their backgrounds. Um, so we have probably one of the most important shows I say this like every week now, but one of the most important shows we've done in a long time. But oh, but before we get to that, well, let me let me tease it by first saying we're going to be talking about Jenkins today, which is the number one uh, uh, worldwide used uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment server. And we have none other than the creator of this software and uh, now beneficial dictator for life, uh, Koshki Kawaguchi, or something close to that. I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name. We'll be bringing him on in just a minute, but also I do have some things I want to say about this particular show and it was brought up to me in the chat room earlier today today is the 10th anniversary of when i started hosting this show and that is amazing well it's plus a week but that's close enough so i just wanted to let people know i've been uh, i was the show first started back in april 7th of 2006 uh, I was first a guest in July 14th of 2006. I first started co-hosting again July 20th, 2007. Uh, it, but it wasn't for another three years that uh, Leo sort of stepped down as being the showrunner. And so I became the showrunner and also the, the primary host on April 2010. So that'll be another time to do a 10th anniversary coming up soon. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that out because uh, you, you got to think 10 years. It's, it's a huge back catalog. It's just really, really amazing. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be doing this and I'll keep doing it as long as they let me do it. So I'm very happy to have that. So let's talk a little about uh, Jenkins. So Jenkins is a continuous integration, continuous deployment server. And what that basically means is that you have something like Jenkins, watch your repos where you're committing with Git or committing with whatever else you're using. And if you're using anything besides Git, why? Come on, <laughs> get, with the, get with the times. Um, and then based on the commits being pushed to certain branches or maybe a timer of some kind, uh, various stages in a pipeline will start triggering to maybe uh, run some tests. And if those pass, uh, package it up to be able to be deployed, uh, maybe even uh, restart uh, your various containers if you're doing a containerized solution and so on. And Jenkins has been around for quite a long time. It actually started uh, back at Sun when uh, Koski uh, created this as a side project uh, because there wasn't anything that was this good <laughs> already. Uh, there was some other stuff there, but it wasn't quite as uh, fancy. So, but it actually started it, uh, being called the Hudson Project. And at some point, Hudson became Jenkins, and we'll actually get into that a little bit later about uh, this whole naming change and stuff. We'll get it from the horse's mouth, of course, obviously, uh, for people who actually know the source. Um, uh, what do you know about this so far, Jonathan? Well, you, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago that if people aren't using it, they're going to want to. I have seen Jenkins used in so many projects. I think everybody is using it, whether they realize it or not. So if, if you... Uh, 
for example, if, if you run uh, what used to be CyanogenMod, now Lineage OS, the most popular open source uh, packaging of Android, it uses Jenkins. Um, I'm, I'm sure Google uses Jenkins all over in their infrastructure. So it, we're at the point now to where basically everybody uses this. It touches their computing experience, whether they realize it or not. It's, it's just, it's that much of the solution to this problem. Well, and I know, and I, and I didn't realize this, but uh, uh, my, my primary client, ZipRecruiter, uh, is actually going to be deploying Jenkins uh, to replace uh, cron jobs, which I thought was sort of an interesting use, because now when we have containers that can be thrown away, we don't want to be doing the actual work of a periodic thing in the containers. We want to basically be able to have worker bees that are going to go out and, and make things uh, based on schedules, and we want to have it uh, easy for the, ed the engineers to uh, add new uh, crony like tasks, but do it now all the way through the uh, the Jenkins interface. So that's a that's a really interesting use case. So I want to get to talk to Koshki about that as well. Uh, but before we do that, this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Amazon Kinesis from AWS. In the information age, data is the new oil. Businesses need data, and there's no better data than real time data, which is why Amazon Web Services built Amazon Kinesis, a powerful new way to collect, process, and analyze streaming data, so you can get timely insights and react quickly to new information. Information. Here's the thing. Websites, mobile apps, IoT sensors, and the like can generate a colossal amount of streaming data, sometimes terabytes an hour. That, if processed in real time, can help you learn about what your customers, applications, and products are doing right now and respond right away. Amazon Kinesis lets you do that easily and at low cost. With just a few clicks, you can start sending data from hundreds of thousands of data sources simultaneously. Loading in real time, it lets you process and analyze the data and take actions promptly. All you need to know is SQL. Kinesis also gives you the flexibility to build your own custom applications using popular stream processing frameworks of your choice. And with Kinesis, you only pay for the resources you use. There is no minimums, no upfront commitments. To learn more about Kinesis, go to kinesis.aws and let's get streaming. That's K-I-N-E-S-I-S dot A-W-S. And we thank them for their support of Floss Weekly. Now let's go ahead and bring on our guests. Uh, Koshki, uh, welcome to the show. Hello, I'm... Uh uh, nice to meet you. Very good. And where are you speaking to us from? So, uh, I, you know, our office, I'm doing this from our Clavis office in San Jose. Um, this is right in front of the airport, and I can see the uh, aircraft uh, leaving and taking off from the, uh, my window. Well, that's an awesome review. When I worked uh, for a company up in uh, uh, Hillsboro, I was right across the street from the Hillsboro Airport, which finally uh, got me to do my uh, full pilot training. So I became an instrument rated pilot just because I was right across the street from the airport. So thank you for that. That works really well. Sure. So give us a 30,000 foot view. What problem are people solving when they reach for Jenkins? Right. So um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the, I think uh, one of the primary use cases is to help people develop and deliver software, right? So we are asked to do more things with you know, a smaller number of people ever faster. So really, like, we've been doing all sorts of as software engineers, right? We've been doing automations. Um, so as you mentioned, the, you, know, you, you put the commit into the source code repository. Uh, and then we have Jenkins build and test and then get the deployment. And if there's anything wrong in that process, you know, it's a web app, so you can go see what went wrong. So that's sort of like a canonical use case. But uh, what I think really made Jenkins popular is uh, because, you know, so there are a lot of other like a random crap of automation that you have to do. Um, and then you mentioned a bit about the cron. So, uh, the kind of Jenkins sort of turned into this, what I think of a general purpose automation platform. So people put all sorts of workflow that happens for some triggers that causes some actions that you want to monitor on. So sometimes, in fact, I explain, you know, if, you, if I'm talking to the ops people, I sometimes explain Jenkins as a, you know, the glorified cron on steroid. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's really, you know, in that sense, a general purpose tool. Okay, so you're basically looking at um, a set of tools, or well, there's the Jenkins platform, but then I also understand there are plugins. What, what's the relationship there? All right, so uh, the you know since this is a well, I've been doing a number of open source projects in the past, uh, and then one of the learning that I've done from that is uh, in order for people you know across the world to collaborate nicely, we need this like a boundaries. We need our own sandboxes. So the, the mechanism, so the, I implemented this mechanism called you know, extensibility of the platform or the plugins that allows you know, random people that I've never met somewhere around the world to develop some functional extension to Jenkins. 
and make things usable for him or her. Right? And mm -hmm. then, so that's the uh, mechanism of the plugins. And through which thinking scope became over time capable of talking to all sorts of tools in the developer ecosystem. So, you know, take version control system, right? I think we have no less than uh, 10 or 20 of those that people are still using, ranging from Git to CVS all the way back to ClearCase. So wow. to cover that spectrum of things, we did really need this, this plugin mechanism. Um, and uh, so that's that's what it does. And so how did this project get started? I, I sort of alluded to it at the beginning of the show, but why don't, we, why don't you tell us from firsthand experience? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, so I had three motivations. So the one was that... Um, and I used to be, so I was working in this small team of four people, right? And then I, I, I used to be the one who breaks the build all the time. So <laughs> I was using CVS, and then I, fa you know, sometimes I forget to commit some files. Uh, and then somebody checks out, you know, my colleague checks out the workspace, and then the build breaks. So he picks up the phone and he calls me, and says, hey, it looks like you touched this file the last time. You know, <laughs> the, you know what's going on there? So at some point, I felt kind of like I embarrassed. Right? So I thought, that, well, I should write a program that catches that before my colleagues does. And all it needs to do is just, you know, check up, keep monitoring, keep uh, monitor this email that's uh, coming from CVS server that I uh, checked in the code and do the build and send me the private email if it doesn't build, right? And uh, and then I actually discovered that I wasn't the only one who was breaking the builds. So, <laughs> so I started uh, you know, sending that email to the other people, um, and then so they kind of got started from there. Um, another motivation was, you know, the um, back then I was working for the group at Sun Microsystems that does the Java EE, which is a application server platform, right? This middleware that we are telling people to build web app on. And I realized mm -hmm. that I haven't written any web app by using it. So I felt that there's, there's something basically wrong if I'm telling people to, you know, if I'm creating a platform that I haven't even used by myself. So I was, it could have been any app, but I was looking for some application that I can justify writing. So this was another, um, this was one of those. And finally, this was back around the days when there was uh, tons of web frameworks. You know, this is uh, in the 2000, I think the three, four-ish. So, uh, you know, there's a uh, Wicked, there's a uh, Spring, there's uh, whatnot. So I, I, you know, I had my own idea of uh, the, doing the web framework. So I did one. And then now that I created a framework, I needed to write some app with it. So, uh, so this was, you know. So in, in many ways, it's sort of like a result of this random coincidence. So you created this originally for just the small group that you were in, and did it start getting noticed by other groups at Sun, and then did that make it more interesting and more challenging to keep uh, expanding it to other people's needs? Yeah, so so it was really helpful that I was the one you know, using it for my team, so my colleagues kept sending me the uh, you know, ideas about how to improve that. You know, what if it's great, what if it does this or that? So it kind of kept me motivated. And, uh, you know, we, in the engineer at Sun, like we used to have this, basically it's the side communication channels, right? So we go to lunch together with people from other teams. And then I kind of, you know, talk about what I've been doing and they, it kind of gets their attention. And I, they started hosting their workload on this, you know, tiny, tiny instance of that tiny server that I was running. Um, and it kind of spread from there. Um, and the other thing I, I think what has happened is this was around the time Sun was really going down the tube, right, in terms of the business. Like, it was not really doing well. Um, so people are leaving left and right. And, you know, they move on to some other companies uh, in the Bay Area or wherever. And they, I think they took the experience of Jenkins with them. So, you know, they introduced the Jenkins into their companies and so on. And, like, it's some, some, like suddenly when I, like, you know, noticed that it was, seems to be used everywhere, um, so I think that was a part of it. So like a sun, the supernova of the sun caused this, like, you know, uh, this experience so, to spread through the industry. So was this open source from the very beginning? Yeah. So yes, I, you know, yes, from the, from the day one. Yeah. Um, everything, most of the projects I've been doing over time as a hobby project is all in open source. So this just was one of those. I didn't expect originally to become this big. <laughs> and so, uh, but at first it was called Hudson, and now it's called Jenkins. Uh, can you tell us about why and how? Right. So, in, in a sense, in fact, in the fact that I did it from day one in open source is, you know, what what really allowed us to keep, what allowed me to keep working on it after I left the company. So, uh, you know, the sum was uh, they acquired. So, for those of you who are too young to remember what was going on. 
uh, the some you know it used to be a big company, but uh, it went really you know the business didn't pan out at some point, and then the so Oracle bought Sun. But um, mm-hmm. this process kind of took long time. Over it kind of spans across more than close to a year. Um, yeah. So you know during that side during that period, I felt like uh, not much is happening. So. Um, but I decided, so I, I thought about leaving the company, um, you know, since Hudson seems to be taking off. So I thought maybe this is something I should do more, you know, interesting things about. Um, mm-hmm. But then I thought, well, like, you know, basically what I have is like a free, free experience of Oracle, right? So I could stick around a little longer. If uh, Oracle decides to lay me off, I get a severance package. It sounded great. Um, if Oracle yes. decides to keep me, then I get to experience Oracle a little bit. And if I don't like it, I can, you know, I can leave the company. I, and I felt like I'm not really losing anything by uh, by by doing that. So I kind of stuck around in the end. Um, and then I got into, I moved to a different part of Oracle that was doing tools. Uh, but, you know, it, it didn't take long for me to discover that, that it's a very different company from Sun. So I decided to, you know, to jump the ship. Um, and you know, originally, initially, there, I, I think that was, I think that was, uh, that that was kind of okay. But I think later, Oracle decided that um, they wanted to do something with Hudson. Um, so you know, and then they they kind of looked around and realized that they, well, I was actually the only one from the Sun that was working on it. Um, mm-hmm. So now, you know, now I'm gone at this point. I'm maybe six months already gone. Um, so they, you know, they thought about how to re-engage with the community, and unfortunately, this part of Oracle didn't seem to know much about how the open source community worked. So um, instead of trying to participate in the project, um, and uh, they, so they, they decided to, um, uh, you know, and I guess the license to the source code. Well, it's open source code, so anyone can hack the code. So they couldn't basically kick me out. So instead, what they decided um, is that they they trademarked the name Hudson. And basically came back to the community of people saying, well, if you want to keep playing in this project, uh, you know, you have to follow what, what we're going to tell you. Um, and that did be like a royally pissed off uh, people in the community. Um, I bet. But yeah, there's a the company who hasn't done any contribution um, that uh, came, came in and said, like, I'm going to be your king. So follow my order. So it's, it's not exactly a great way to, you know, to have a productive relationship. So I think that's the point where we said, well, you know, we are not lawyers, we're just a bunch of developers, so we don't know how to fight the trademark fight, but you know, we can just rename the project and then keep our toys to ourselves. Um, <laughs> so that's what, uh, you know, so one day, like we, you know, three of us got together in the IRC and a, we met, went to this Wikipedia page, which has this list of all the fictional and real butlers. So we went from A, B, C, and so on. It started with Alfred, the Batman's butler, um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, looked for the, uh, you know, the checking, making sure that we have some domain name available, like no, no conflicting looking software project, and so on. Uh, turns out that the Alfred is a name. I think it was uh, some sort of like a personal assistant software for Mac. Yeah, and yeah it's I'm also, actually using it every day. Oh, yeah, okay, I use it every yeah. day. Yeah. yeah, and um, you know, coming out of this trademark fight, we didn't want to pick up the name that the Hollywood owns any right on, right? That sounds like a disaster in terms of the trademark. Yeah. So we went down the list, and Jenkins sounded like a great, you know, great butler-sounding name, and it was available. <laughs> so it sounded nice. like you know, that's the name, yeah. Okay, so you renamed the project from uh, from Hudson to Jenkins, but there still was a Hudson at Oracle, right? Yeah, so I think Oracle, I think this, this course of the event was unexpected by Oracle. Um, and then so I think they regrouped and they decided to basically dump the project to the Eclipse Foundation. So I think it's still technically there, but um, really not, not much work is going on because, again, you know, basically the entire developer community has, has moved to Jenkins. Well, and actually, uh, I was in the uh, chat room for Jenkins just earlier, and it was revealed to me that... Actually, Hudson is effectively a fork of Jenkins. That, uh, <laughs> that Oracle actually forked, and uh, John, if you bring up that commit, it, they took the code base after it had been renamed Jenkins, and then renamed it back to Hudson. <laughs> so, so, so all these years I've been thinking Jenkins is a John. You got that commit? Um, <laughs> we got a graphic that we want to put up here. So. Um, yeah, there it is. See, so here's the code commit that takes it back from Jenkins to Hudson, and this is in Oracle's uh, repo. 
So yeah. that, that was pretty darn cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is a reverse fork, I guess. It's pretty it, bizarre. Yeah. The, yeah, I yeah. guess I think of it as a rename indeed. Um, and, but it's kind of sad because, you know, the, the, the people they put on this project is, um, is somebody I knew from a long time back at Sun, and I had some fond memories with him and so on. So, but now there's a, you know, it's kind of a awkward. Um, well, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Monty Widenius says the same thing about the Maria MySQL split, is that there were still, you know, his friends were still working at Sun, so he couldn't badmouth them too much because they were still his friends and his team members eventually, or ultimately. So, uh, yeah, I can totally understand that. Um, uh, I think Jonathan wants to step in with a couple of questions. John, you want to start there? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the open source thing. What What license does this actually use? So uh, the so one of the like uh, super developers that I respect a lot, um, he he uses MIT license for everything he does. So I kind of uh, you know early on, long before I started Hudson, like I decided that every project I'm gonna do will be under the MIT license, and then so is like uh, so is Hudson, and then so Jenkins is under MIT license now. Okay, what uh, what language is uh, Hudson and now Jenkins programmed in? So the Jenkins, the, the majority of the code is in Java, um, and then there's a little bit of you know other uh, things here and there, like you know there are some native integration that we need to do for say Windows platforms and so on. So there are a tiny amount of code in .NET and C and whatnot, but the uh, you know well I work for Sun, right? So the, the, the choice of the language <laughs> is not a, that's not a question up to me. <laughs> I was going to make a comment about the former Sun developer doing something in Java just being so surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you mentioned that you left Oracle. Have you have you since made a business out of Jenkins? Right. So uh, after I left uh, Oracle, so I started doing uh, the, you know, the company around uh, the Jenkins. Right. So this seems like it's been using used by so many people. I should be able to like you know, I, I wanted to spend more time with it. So. Now I, I'm at the I'm a CTO at the CloudBees, uh, where we do basically what Red Hat does to Linux, we do to Jenkins. So um, you know it's been an interesting journey for past uh, five six years now, I think. So that that sounds interesting. We do have an active chat room, and we did have a question from there. Um, Epony wants to know what are the, some of the interesting deployments that you know of. Are there any any really interesting stories that you've heard? Uh, interesting deployments. Um, so I think the generally kind of goes into two directions. Um, the one is people running lots of lots of them. Um, so you know now is things like uh, Kubernetes or the you know the, the, the container management layer. Uh, some people with sufficient power of scripting can launch lots of lots of masters. And in a large companies with lots of developers, they did do that kind of things. So I occasionally talk to people who have, you know, the, the number of deployments in the range of the five or eight hundreds. So that's a mind-boggling number for me. Yeah, because each of, each of those Jenkins is a server that can support, you know, like a team of people easily, right? Mm -hmm. So to think that there are company has, some company has that many developers all using Jenkins is uh, it's a great feeling. Uh, the other direction is like some people just decide to put like so, all the workload into just one Jenkins deployment. Um, so that that does show up in terms of uh, large number of Jenkins jobs. So I see, you know, these, I think the biggest I've seen is a seven thousand jobs on one master. So it's a uh, it's a scary place, but you know, because if you if that goes down for some reason, they, all the eggs, you know, it basically lights out for the entire company. But um, but that was uh, interesting, um, and then maybe I suppose some other ones like you know the, the I received I once I received a bug report saying like I'm running Jenkins on the IBM mainframe which is not ASCII compatible, so wow. you know, I, I, got, I got to fix some bugs in there here and there. So I was like, wow, you know, they talk about the, all the corner of the world that it's spreading. Yeah, so people are doing AI <laughs> in the mainframe. You should you can do it if they can do it. That's that's quite funny. So I, I was actually just thinking uh, thinking about a next question whether someone has gone so far as to run it on a mainframe. So now we know Jenkins is everywhere, even even on the uh, the old big iron. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mean, plug, yeah. go go ahead. Well, I mean, I think about it, it makes sense because the stuff that people are running on mainframe is uh, really business critical, mission critical things. 
So obviously they're looking for every opportunity to like improve productivity for them. And from what I've heard, people there are really not that many people who can do mainframe stuff nowadays. So uh, again, that that creates more motivation for like additional productivity boost around them. So yeah, jokes aside, it's a, it's perfectly sensible thing for them to do. Sure, makes sense. Uh, we we mentioned the plugins and extensions. Are those only written in Java, or can we branch out and use other languages? Is there support for C, Python, all of those things? Yeah. So the um, at one point, uh, somebody took on this project to basically implement this like a layer uh, that allows uh, Ruby in you know, running on JRuby to basically extend Jenkins. So. Uh, the you know, entire system was built to allow plugins to be developed in Ruby. Um, it, it, it did have some initial success, but we I think that we lost the, uh, the the guy who was leading it, and then, so it's kind of uh, still dormant in in the corner of the Jenkins community. Um, I think it'd be really cool to redirect that, but uh, it's kind of waiting for the driver. So so pretty much all of the plugins are in Java now. That that's just yeah. how that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we we mentioned um, that uh, there there's the big Android um, uh, distribution uh, it, it uh, that uses Jenkins and, and someone in the chat room that's thanked me for calling it out. Um, do do you see any interesting things where where hardware like firmware for hardware and such uses Jenkins. Um, and then is there any uh, like continuous integration testing where Jenkins actually loads the firmware onto the hardware and run tests against it? It seems like it could be an interesting use case. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think there are all sorts of people, you know, embedded devices in general uh, is an area people really care about the quality because it's not easy to, you know, fix the problem in the field once it ships outside the factory. So. Uh, we see, I see a lot of uh, industry, like uh, medical devices, the car manufacturers, um, the you know the phones are another great example. They are all using. Uh, there are a lot of users of Jenkins in those spaces. Um, I, I once talked to, um, I guess, the big telco provider, and they sell, you know, they sell this, I guess, the equipment, right? Um, so this this company wrote the custom plugins. So that they have a, basically test devices connected to the series of Jenkins agents. Um, they wrote a custom plugin to basically act as a librarian, right? So they can coordinate which test is using what box at the moment. So yeah, they are doing this kind of like a flash in the firmware, run the test, and they shut them down and stuff like that. It's very common. Um, I also, uh, this is another cool thing I remember. Like I, at one point, I visited the headquarters of BMW. Right? So they had this like a rack full of... Um, so they are testing. I remember one that they are testing a headlight, and apparently there's some like a small microcontroller in it and connected to the Ethernet through the network inside the car. Right? It's kind of mind blowing. So there's a test station that has like a 20 or so uh, headlights, and then that was controlled by some sort of automation tooling. Um, so you know these things are done by people do that all the time. Yeah, I've seen some of them. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure what I think about the headlights in a car connected to an internet. That's that sounds <laughs> like a recipe for disaster. But I'm glad yeah, they're using it, good software to test it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I don't think it's connected to the internet, but uh, I believe the uh, network that runs inside the car is standard Ethernet. Um, the funny thing, I used to. So the office we used to be in, uh, we are in the second floor, and the first floor there's another company called Cloud Cars. We are cloud bees, so like they always, they, they, you know, the postal people always make mistakes about delivering packages to the wrong place. So I went down and they come up occasionally, um, and they had this like a car's dashboard and pulled out with a USB port and the keyboard connected. So I think it was a Prius. So and uh, you know, so you know, I guess the fact that they are using the standard uh, the component that we are used to, like a Ethernet, apparently makes it very hackable. In, in, yeah, indeed. Um, so, what what kind of uh, Epony again wants to wants to know what size is the community? Do you have any idea of how many people are uh, are hacking on your code base and are interested in this? Right. Um, so, the in terms of the developer community, um, I believe our GitHub organization currently counts like uh, one thousand developers. Um, most of them are what I call like a single plugin developer. So they you know they brought they brought their own plugin. To the community and they own and they maintain that plugin. 
Right? So in that sense, like a, there's a there's like a sandbox for everyone. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of drive-by contributors uh, who just you know, post pull requests and move on. Um, we don't have exact tracking of how many people there exist. But uh, we are currently counting, I think, the 1,300 plugins. And there's one new plugin almost every other day. So still a lot of people bringing, you know, the expanding. There are a lot of people working on every part of the Jenkins community expanding its capabilities. So in in the in your introduction, you you talked about uh, Jenkins being used. It was then Hudson being used to catch problems in uh, in software. So I assume it's been built from the beginning with the idea of integrating with the test suite. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, the when I created this, the, the work, the way we worked at Sun was, uh, you know, there's a software development people and there's a QA counterpart. So I used to produce the binary and then we send it, you know, to the well. There's the nightly builds that the DDC engineering team creates and the QA people get that and test them. But during the day, like you know, they, if they discover issues, we fix them. Then we send them the new binary. That they run the test again. So there is this like a back and forth of a program to be binary to be tested and also the test results. So I thought, well, like this seems like awfully inefficient to, you know, because we need to, think, people kind of get off track and not everybody is on the same page about what program, what binary was tested that contained what changes and so on, right? So in Jenkins, from very early days, I had this like a test report comprehension so that we can spot. You know, the, we can, anyone can see, I can just send a URL in the chat room or if they, everybody know where to come to to see the latest test reports. And it shows, for example, what new tests have failed or what tests have been fixed. And so like if I and Joe made the digressions in different areas of the code the night, the day before, uh, then we got two sets of different pages going on. So I might fix one part and he might fix the other part. But I, we, we need to know like the delta, right? No, no, just knowing that the amount of failure is not sufficient. You want to know what new tests that are failing. So these things are all part of the Jenkins functionalities. So there are a whole bunch of different ways to test code and a whole bunch of testing frameworks. How does how does Jenkins integrate with you know things as varied as you know a custom framework written in Perl and C unit tests? And I'm sure there's a million of them that I'm not even aware of. You know, do we have right. to have a plugin for each of these, or is there kind of a common interface that makes it all work? Yeah. So this is one of the frustrating things. Is like you know the test report format. There's only so many variations you can have, right? There's a test and there's an output, and whether it succeeded or failed, and maybe how long it took. But uh, so I really love to see some sort of like a standardization for things like this. But there's nothing, uh, you know, as I guess. The open source community is just not good at this kind of like a stand collaboration, so that doesn't happen. But there's a, this one format that was de facto uh, the most popular. I think it was originally invented by Apache Ant, which is a Java build tool um, for the JUnit. So it's not even owned by the test tool; it's uh, invented by the build tool. Um, but uh, so I think that a lot of tests. Uh, frameworks did support that support this output format. So the most of the Ruby testing frameworks do. Uh, so is Node.js. So Jenkins you know, support this format, and that's the easiest way to get things going. Um, but it, uh, as you said, uh, you know, the this is a we also have this like a plugin mechanism. So uh, just like you know, this very incredible diversity in the version control system. People can write a parser of the test reports, and then there's a predefined domain model inside Jenkins that you could use um, to basically parse your data into, and then you can leverage the rest of the visualizations or the data analysis features in Jenkins, or you know you could completely invent your own basically test result presentations. Uh, so those things are also possible too. So yeah, well, collectively it covers everything really. You know, I, I have to apologize now. I, you know, as I said at the beginning of the show, they let anybody do this show. And apparently I'm getting old and completely overlooked the fact that this is a welcome back to the show. We had you back on 2011. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, that's right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, you didn't let me know either. So maybe we're we're both forgetting everything that we've done interviewing wise. It's just been so crazy that way. So, so that was 
that, that's actually a long time ago in terms of internet years. So what's happened to the project since 2011? And I understand you're coming out with version two soon. You want to give us the, 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 the intermediate history and, and the future? Right. So uh, the so I think the yeah. So the version two. So, um, so Jenkins has been on this like a continuous improvement mode for the longest time. So there's a new release coming out every week. So at one point it got to like a release. You know, I did a 1.1, 1.2, and so on, and you get 1.10, 11, 12, and then all the way up to I think the 1.600, 40 something. <laughs> Um, and then at some point, like we realized that okay, well, so I was kind of looking forward to do some version two, um, and then you know, this has, this actually already happened maybe a year ago, um, and uh, we we've been driving this. Um, so since then, we've been driving this major effort called the Jenkins pipeline, uh, which allows you to define this CI/CD process in more manageable 21st century-ish way, uh, and we can mm -hmm. talk more about that. But um, so. I kind of wanted to communicate to the, the users at large that you know we are kind of shifting the uh, the sweet spot of Jenkins from this classic way of doing things into the newer pipelines. So the version two sounded like a great way to you know to get that message. And also, I've been disappointed that they, you know I was kind of hoping that they, this Jenkins should be on the Guinness World Record of craziest version number for being you know, one dot six hundred something, <laughs> but that, that didn't happen. So at some point, it was creating more confusion. I felt like so. That's uh, so I went back to it. So that, you know I think uh, somewhere last year, or so, I think uh, we we put the the Jenkins pipeline in the, the heart of Jenkins, and we we called that the Jenkins version too. Um, so the, this Jenkins pipeline is one major project that we've been taking on. And another one is uh, the what we call the Blue Ocean. Um, so this Jenkins project, right? It, it started in 2004, and that was back in time when uh, you know the HTML was rendered on the server side. There's no, there's really no JavaScript. Well, let's say, or the, I mean, there was JavaScript, but it wasn't used anywhere like it's used today. So today the web the way web app is built is very different, right? Um, you know, the HTMLs and assets and JavaScripts are basically static files. The server just do not like touch those. Um, and then the API, you know, the, instead the server just becomes a REST API server. So um, mm. at some point, I mean, this the fact that we are on the incremental improvements means meant that we couldn't make this kind of drastic change. So uh, the Blue Ocean project started uh, this one, I think, uh, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, so we wanted to completely rethink the way the Jenkins UI is. Um, and then so, you know, we, the Cloudbees put together this team of uh, seven or so engineers. They, they worked on this really hard. Uh, and then we shipped uh, Blue Ocean earlier this year. So that's probably the latest, biggest news from the community. Um, and you know, they, I think you can people who not everyone is already using it, which is why I'm talking about this. But um, mm -hmm. uh, people who used it really seems to like it. Um, so you know, I went, I saw some commentary in the Hacker News, which is normally I think of a very cynical, difficult to please cloud. Uh, but uh, even there, the reaction was very positive. So I was really happy to see that. And uh, Epony in the uh, or Epony, whatever way you want to pronounce that, in our chat room actually asked again. Uh, well, separate question: Have they found the limits of the platform of the JVM? Are you running up against limits that you really wish weren't there? Uh, uh, well, let's. See. I mean, the I don't know. So there are issues. I mean, you can blame issues either on the VM, or I could also equally blame it on the Jenkins side for like you know stretching things in a way that I shouldn't. So there's you know there's a number of those. So I guess um, I think the things that they really wanted the platform to fix is uh, some of the error diagnosability. Um, you know, mm -hmm. this, um, there's just something we can't I can't touch. There are things in there that I just can't touch. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, well, actually knowing that the Java AC team was right under the, the the floor below us, maybe I could have just written patch for something, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't that brave. Um, so, but you know, overall, I think I'm very happy with JVM. I mean, it's a, it's a very stable working horse. Uh, and I think, you know, the fact that, the, for example, the JRuby is seen as a, a, like a most viable production platform for Ruby, I mean, that speaks something. So 
I did have a lot yeah. of respect for people who did this work, uh, the JVM, and I'm really glad that Oracle is keeping that going strong as well. Cool, cool. And there's a lot of other players in the same community. If I'm looking at the uh, uh, comparison of continuation software on the Wikipedia, and I see other names in the open source realm like uh, Continuum and Gump and GoCD and Cruise Control. Uh, why would someone reach for Jenkins instead of one of the other ones? Uh, so if you if you think of so actually those are the those are not the guys who I think of as a current competition. So yeah, so if you think of this like open source CI C D server, really, that that battle is already you know, there's no yeah, there's I don't think any well, let's see. Um I, I don't think there's any reason to choose um uh, let's, well, so I guess I should justify that a little better, right? So I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, that's the it, point. <laughs> yeah, so I think this open source project is that um, the you know there's a value as the community gets bigger, like it creates this like a positive viral cycles, right? So because more people are using it, um, there's more Google footprints, there's more question and answers on the Stack Overflow. So your question, the question you have is probably already solved by somebody else. Um, and the Jenkins being the extensible platform, meaning even if your organization is doing something esoteric and every organization is doing something a little strange, uh, you can make Jenkins meet your organization, not the other way around, which is really handy. Um, and it also works you know, through this extensible plugin system. You can work with anything. So, you know, if, if you're using ClearCase, you know, and it's, it's, not, it's not easy to switch those things. So you can just add Jenkins without upsetting all the existing things you're doing. Right? So right. the fact that it doesn't force all the massive change is a key, key plus. I think the, the modern day, actually, more interesting competition nowadays is uh, the coming from the services. Right? So um, people running uh, the CI, CD as a service. And uh, so that's what I pay more attention to. And some of the things that we are doing in the Jenkins pipeline, like... Uh, allowing you to configure jobs inside the source code repositories and its version control and code reviews and all that stuff is uh, sort of, you know, the, I think making sure that uh, we, you know, we are, we offer the same kind of ease and ease of use and value that this hosted CI as a service do. Very good. And also, I'll say in, in your defense, uh, when you look at the number of things like builders and integrations, uh, there are way more many keywords under the Jenkins line than any other one of the things that without maybe the exception of Travis. Uh, so, yes, you're clearly winning the space in terms of the open source community. So I definitely appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit yeah. more about CloudBees. What is CloudBees bringing to the picture? Is there a commercial version of Jenkins that uh, I can get uh, or is it just more support? Right. So um, what, what I Realize, um, so, I, well, open source is a great way to reach like a different corners of the world, right? But the one of the limitations is that the, this is only reaching to the developers and people who are technical, um, and then so they can drive this kind of change in the develop, you know, automation, change like automation or developer productivity gain from bottom up. Uh, but in for larger organizations, for them to really make the difference, you need more organizational wide. Uh, approach to this. Right? It's not sufficient that the every team, like if you're, I don't know, if you're like uh, the big bank, right, the Bank of America or something, you have like a flat, probably tens of thousands of developers, so you know, and, and thousands of applications. So if individual heroes in those thousands, like a thousand of teams, individually try to make this change, it's not going to really like be very effective or productive. So. Mm -hmm. to, to drive this change at this larger organization level, we need. I realize that just having the open source project is not sufficient. Uh, so I think of the maybe the primary value that the cloud is bring on the table is to drive that kind of change from, you know, the higher from the from the top down, right? and then combined with this open source reach from the bottom up, we, we sort of can drive the change much faster. So uh, you know we have a you know, supported version of Jenkins. You know the uh, we we help people deploy large-scale Jenkins as a service inside the company and operate those. And enterprise has, you know, or the managers have these kind of requirements that the individual plugin developers don't really care about, like you know, security or the monitoring or reporting or that metrics and that sort of stuff. So you know, we, our, our products implement some of these features. Um, so I really think of it as a sort of like a nice, like a good, valuable addition to the open source community that sort of expands the reach of the Jenkins. Uh, and when that happens, I think everyone benefits. 
So is the community edition then uh, the upstream of your commercial edition? Yeah, so what we do is uh, we, we take the same core, so Jenkins core, and then we write some proprietary plugins, and then we package the whole thing. And, you know, it's there's more than what's inside Jenkins, right? It's like, um, so the, one of the flagship software does uh, you know, help you run large-scale Jenkins on the container managed layer. So there's an integration for those lower-level things, like how do we manage storage? So those glue code, you think, can think of it, is necessary to turn these pieces into a solution. So that's what uh, that, that's that's include that's the part of the product from a technical perspective. And uh, is, is the community then mostly in charge of the community edition, or does Cloud B still have a kind of a tight fist over that? So the uh, because of what happened with Oracle, I think this community really wants to be independent from any single you know the vendor. So. Cloud is unlike some other projects. So let's say like a puppet, you know, in case of the puppet, the company, the puppet, the company owns the puppet, the project, right? So right. they own the trademark and so on. But it's not like that in the Jenkins project. So the Jenkins project is actually an independent project under the uh, nonprofit organization. So they own the trademark and so on. So Cloud is just a, you know, it's a, it is a biggest participant, but it, it is quote unquote just a participant. Um, okay. okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, so and, to answer your question, yeah, to answer your question, it's the you know the I I don't want to I don't want to call it the community edition. It's just in fact it's the Jenkins, and then it's yeah, yeah it's, it's it's fate is controlled by the product itself. That's awesome. Uh, I imagine you have a large enough uh, community now that uh, you have uh, conferences. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think uh, we, this is what the sixth, seventh time now. Um, so we have uh, what we call the Jenkins World. It's an annual event. That happens in San Francisco Bay Area, um, and this year it's going to be the end of uh, August. Um, and you know, in the open source projects, especially the big one like this, there are a lot of people like in the, even in the community that you do not know. You know, you only know just by a name or their avatar on uh, on uh, on the uh, GitHub or you know on the Jira. Right? So yeah. to be able to see them in in live and you know, also interacting with users, and they come up and like share, tell us about how the, all the awesome things that they are doing, and you know, they they you know they give kudos to the people working on the project, and they, I, I can see that the developers are really appreciating those interactions. So it's I you know it's kind it's kind of becoming this uh, gathering for the community that I think uh, people coming there gets a lot of kick out of. Well, I found going to, you know, I, I go to the Pearl Conference every year and I go to OSCON every year. Um, uh, it, it is good to see the people that are actually working on things and uh, the hallway track and the boffs and even just the informal, you know, let's all grab a bite over here kind of meetups actually are, right. I think, where the real work gets done. So it's good to see that you actually have conferences already uh, in place. And that tells me that uh, Jenkins is a mature product uh, project and uh and it's uh, definitely good. So, what's uh, after 2.0 is out, or is 2.0 already out? And what's on the roadmap coming up? So, uh, this pipeline in Blue Ocean, I think it's still got a lot more work to do. Um, the, uh -huh. So, I think there'll be a more continual, continuous improvement over these things. So, for pipeline, for example, we want to well, make it more easier to use. So we are working on, you know, spending a lot of effort outside the sort of software itself like one, one so as i was talking to more users i realized that the our biggest problem is not having more features but actually explain the features that we already have um so that's something we are spending a lot of effort building a new website and stuff like that uh, blue ocean is still you know still one node uh, i mean still relatively new effort and you know the user interface of jenkins is a big it's a, it's a big area so we still have to do a lot more work to, you know, add more things that's that's currently not part of the Blue Ocean. We need to work with the plugin developers to, you know, the bring their functionality into Blue Ocean. And so, yeah, so those uh, more more work like that is being planned. So one of the one of the things that I've seen advertised for some of these continuous integration uh, projects is GitHub integration, and of course everyone is on GitHub now. Right. Does Jenkins support talking with GitHub and being able to, uh, you know, run tests automatically on changes and such as that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, obviously, the GitHub integration is very important to us. So, uh, one of the one of the cool thing you can do with GitHub is, you know, the 
if you work, so the, initially as a setup, you tell Jenkins where is your GitHub organization is. Um, and then the Jenkins start monitoring all your repositories and all your branches. And as soon as you commit a file named Jenkins file, which defines your CI CD process into your repository somewhere, then it automatically begins the building that branch. And you know, as soon as you open the PR, it gets built and result gets pushed back into the PR as a sort of like a commit commit status and all sorts of integration kind of happens automatically um, just by telling Jenkins where the GitHub org is. So that's a part of the Jenkins pipeline feature. Um, makes it really easy to get the CI CD. Um, yeah, so I think we got a great GitHub integrations. And so one more question I want to ask, and this was inspired by someone from the chat room, uh, is is Jenkins self-hosting? Do you guys uh, eat your own tail in, in this case? And how does that work? <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, we have more than one Jenkins instance for the community. Um, so there's a one that keeps track of our core. Um, and then all the PRs that comes into the project gets built and tested. Uh, there we use another separate instance for the uh, more sensitive infra work. So you know we need to build this plugin distribution mechanism with sign bits and stuff like that. Um, so the key we didn't want the key to sign these things to be on the like a lower grade instance. So we have another one. Um, and then finally, the cloud is uh, host this uh, third instance for the plugin developers. So there's a large number of those, so like it, you know, it costs a lot of money to get the bills and so on. So instead of paying that out from the the community, it's like a tight budget. Uh, it's one of the contributions that the cloud is bringing to the community is to host this instance and provide the same experience. Um, so yes, so we do use our eat our own food. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we haven't asked that you'd like to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Um, well, I no, I think it's I think we covered it pretty well. Yeah. So the Jenkins, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing more people in Jenkins world. I've seen some of the stage set up and uh, the speaker line up, and I think it's really looking awesome. So it's the end of the August, and uh, go search for Jenkins world in Google, and I think you'll find it. So looking forward to seeing you. Yep. How often do you have these? I'm, I'm not going to be able to make the August one, but uh, when's the next one? Uh, the, the next one will be next year. So, okay, every year. All right, all right. Well, you should invite me. I would come. I would come <laughs> hang out. That'd be fun. I'm I'm good at that. I'm good. I'm I'm a, I'm a pretty good party animal. So, <laughs> you know, invite me and I'll I'll make the party. It's always yeah. that way. Two final questions that I have to ask everybody, which is, um, what's your favorite scripting language? Ah, so I, I have to say it's a uh, groovy. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of like a Java variant that they yeah, designed yeah, built by uh, one of my superhero engineer. Um, can can you put that with a pound bang line? Can you put groovy on a pound bang line and it just works? Uh, you have to compile yeah, it. Yes. Uh, no, no, you don't need to compile it. So it, that works. Wow. That's yeah. cool. So you can actually write Java code. Well, smart Java code, actually, because Groovy is uh, <laughs> yeah. actually usable Java. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's got enough of yeah. the right things in it, yes. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I, I diss Java like every third show on the show because I, I hate Java. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, okay. Okay. And the other oh. question, and I, I think I know the answer to the other question, which is what is your text editor of choice? Uh, so, um, I, so for the text, most of the work happens in IDE for Java things. Um, so, I mean, in fact, if you're doing that, for, for the reason I think the people this Java is because I think they expect to edit Java program in the VI or Emacs, right? But <laughs> that, that, that's, that's really not the right way to do it. So if you use a no. proper IDE, then I think you get a great productivity gain. But now just to more succinctly answer your question, I use VI. Um, oh, so you still didn't get it. But, and, and what IDE do you use? Do you use uh, Eclipse or, or so something else? I use, I use IntelliJ. I guess this is another IntelliJ. thing I picked up. You know, I was trying to, this is another idea, another thing I picked up from uh, this super, you know, one of my heroes, which was using MIT. So he was using IntelliJ and MIT license for everything. So I had to, of course, copy him. Yeah, I, I hate the look of IntelliJ. I hate the look of uh, even WebStorm. Which is uh, another variant on that. I hate the look of Eclipse. Uh, I'm actually starting to uh, be pretty happy with uh, Visual Studio Code. It's got a really mm. good feel to it, and it can do Dart, which is the most important thing to me, Dart and Flutter. Uh, mm. But I'm actually, it actually might be enough to get me away from developing using Emacs. So that <laughs> says a lot. I, I still use yeah. Emacs to read my mail and be on IRC and read news, but. 
because uh, uh, VS Code can't do that yet. <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of uh, editing code, I think I may be switching over. So that'll be uh, sort of fascinating for me. Hey, uh, yeah. uh, very sorry to not recognize that we had you on this show before. Uh, like I said, I'm getting old. I'm 55 now. Times, times just go by. But uh, it's been really wonderful having you on the show and uh, updating us on where Jenkins is is been and where it's going. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having me. Very good. So that was Koshiki uh, Kawaguchi mispronounced, but uh, hopefully that's close enough for, for uh, horseshoes. What do you think there, Jonathan? Uh, I think uh, I think Jenkins is one of those one of those uh, projects that uh, either everyone has heard of or everyone needs to hear of that's doing anything with source code. Uh, in, right. in fact, I'm, I've been thinking of a couple of places where I might make use of it in the various projects I have my fingers in. Um, to, just a, a really interesting, especially with their ecosystem with all the plugins and everything, to be able to uh, uh, reach out and work with a whole bunch of different systems. Uh, you know, sounds like pretty easily just write a, a simple plugin to do it. Uh, so definitely, a, definitely a big player in in open source and you know trying to do things properly where you, you catch problems right away. Because there's nothing worse than having a build that's been out for a week and then somebody finally tell you, by the way, that's totally and utterly broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, we have this uh, at Zip. We've got uh, BuildBot, which is a Python-based solution, and it's been uh, running for a while. A lot of tooling around it, unfortunately, so we've got some heavy investments in it. But we are definitely moving to Jenkins, uh, at least for the crony jobs, uh, but probably also for a continuous integration uh, pipeline, especially as we start moving more towards containers. Uh, definitely a BuildBot is not uh, not going to work for that. Uh, and I also like the idea of being able to tell precisely, you know, what commit broke the build because we have a continuous problem uh, for the Pushmeister, which is sometimes me, but mostly my uh, coworker Liz, uh, <laughs> to actually, you know, figure out, you know, okay, between this build and this build, it went from green to red, but who did it? You know, we know that there were seven commits added to that, but which one of those actually did break the build? We need to know this. So we're uh, hopefully working towards a system if it's built in BuildBot or more likely it's going to be rebuilt in Jenkins uh, before we get too much farther along because that will definitely help us scale. So, uh, yeah, Jenkins is it. There's really there's really no other player in the space. You know, I had to ask, uh, ask him what, what he thinks the other players were, but obviously he said, nah, there's nobody else, <laughs> which is right. <laughs> That's true. I can see why he'd be thinking that. It'd be like asking Linus, uh, is there any other operating systems besides Linux that you might want to recommend? Uh, <laughs> it's really not going to happen. Okay, we're almost out of time. So let me, uh, let me wrap up the end of the show here. Um, we've got next week, we've got Containership, which is cross-platform deploying and managing of containers. Uh, we're going to have the people from allthingsopen.org uh, on the show following that to talk about this conference that I've been invited to for the first time, which is going to be fun out in the Research Triangle. LibreOffice is going to get an update after five years of not being on the show. Kazoo is also going to get an update. So that's Cloud to with a very special co-host, I presume. And that show, we're looking at moving to Thursday instead of Wednesday because of a uh, potential conflict. Uh, hopefully only that week because I don't generally like Thursdays. It's not a very good fun day for me. Anyway, um, Aquameta, nope, sorry, uh, Hiawatha Web Server, which is a security-focused web server. Uh, Aquameta, which is a web dev environment designed around datafication using Postgres. And I have no idea what that means. Uh, Friendhub.cloud, which is a desktop OS in a browser tab. So there's been many of those before, but here's a new one uh, trying to enter that arena. Crail, which is high-performance storage and networking for uh, high-performance data. Uh, anything else uh, that is not on that list uh, and you want on that list, you can go to twit.tv slash floss. And you'll see the people we're also still working on. And if something is not on that list, that's what I meant to say, then please uh, tell a project leader or community coordinator to email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, and we will put them on that list and get them into a slot. We have plenty of slots still open for between now and the end of the year, uh, although we've got about six or seven of them already taken between now and uh, – six or seven weeks from now. Uh, we have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. Uh, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. You can also follow, that gets uh, transmitted over to uh, Twitter at, at Floss Weekly. You can follow me at Randall Old Schwartz on Google+, Plus, and that uh, tweets over to at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N. I'll be in DragonCon in just a few weeks. I'll be presenting on three or four panels, including a moderating a panel on the... Um, hacking ability of self-driving cars. Uh, I don't have to know much about it. I just need to be able to ask good questions of our experts. I'm, I'm a moderator for a panel. I'm also going to be doing my one-hour talk on why Dart should be your next programming language, which I hope to also deliver uh, other places too, so you'll get a good video of it somewhere else. Uh, let's see, I'm also going to be at the Open Source Summit in L.A. Uh, I think that's the first week of October. I think it's coming up. No, maybe it's the first week in September. 
Uh, second week in September. Okay, and then uh, allthingsopen.org, of course, over in the Research Triangle. Uh, possibly, I was contacted by the people at FISLE in Brazil. That conference might actually happen, but they're really concerned about the funding that they're getting or not getting from the government anymore because the government's actually sliding backwards and not really pushing open source anymore. Hmm, new regimes, new payoffs, probably. I don't know. It could be corruption. We don't know. We, we don't know anything about that. Anyway, anything you want to plug there, Jonathan? Uh, I I do actually. I don't have uh, quite the uh, schedule coming up that you do, but I've I've got a new project that I find <laughs> Nobody interesting. Nobody does. <laughs> I, well, I don't know that I can handle that schedule. Um, so I recently started playing with Fedora twenty six with a vanilla kernel or close to vanilla kernel on the Raspberry Pi, and uh, doing GPIO is quite a pain because you know the old way that uh, that everybody used in Raspbian doesn't work with the vanilla kernel. So I've got a new project put together that that actually talks to the kernel the right way in Python and does GPIO. I tweeted out a link to it on my Twitter, which of course is right down somewhere here, JP underscore Bennett. Uh, check that out if you're doing a GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. might be interesting to you. Cool, Jonathan. Well, uh, th welcome, not welcome. <laughs> Thank you once again. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I got eight hours Anybody? of sleep last night. I did not understand why I'm so far off today. I think it's because I woke up really early, even though it was still eight hours after when I went to bed. So anyway, uh, thanks, Jonathan, once again for co-hosting the show. And I'm sure you'll be back on soon since you seem to be almost always available, which is really handy for me. Um, and so thank you for doing that. Yep. I always enjoy it. Cool, cool. And we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.